Hey, what's going on? God bless you. It's so good to see you on Word Up Wednesday at Thou Will Be Done Christian Church. We have a great word on today, the tale of two churches. Let's pray. Let's get into this word. Let's see what God has to say to us. Father, we thank you. We bless you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your goodness, your awesomeness, your uh, amazing grace and mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. Father, we want to be the church that you called us to be that are not just looking the part, but we're actually being a part, being the church, the people that you have called us to be, Father God, to not only be blessed, but blessed to be a blessing, uh, to share our faith, Father God, to grow stronger in our love for you and our love for one another, especially those of the household of faith, including those who are all created in your image. We're just thankful for another day that you provided. Give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of your word that we may apply into our lives, Father, that we may be more like you through your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead and guide uh, through each and every uh, biblical verse that we will read and study and teach on tonight. Father God, we thank you for your anointing that destroys the yokes, Father God. We thank you for your anointing that releases power, Father. We're thankful for your presence where the fullness of joy is. We honor you and bless you. I pray for those who may be watching God and who need to rededicate their life to you, Father. They've been struggling, they've been dealing with many different issues, and they need to know that you are forgiving God, that they haven't done anything so bad that they can't be forgiven, that the blood can't wash them clean, and you can't make them new and whole again. We honor you, we bless you, and we love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray that your week has been great so far. It's hump day, it's Wednesday. It's the last day of March. March is always an exciting month. For me and my family, it's a lot of birthdays, a lot to celebrate. And it's also springtime. It's a new season. We transition out of winter, even though it's still a little cool here and there. But overall, we can see the uh, different branches starting to bud, different flowers and fruit and leaves. And that is just symbolic in knowing that seasons change in our lives. But God still desires to blossom and bloom where we're planted in our lives. So I pray that as God continues to sow the seed of his word in us, as we continue to allow the living word of Jesus Christ, the living water, pour out on our lives, I pray that we grow and develop and mature and be everything that God has created us for, called us to be, and commissioned us to do. Let's get into this word. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. There's going to be other verses and other characters in the Bible that we're going to talk about, but this is going to be the starting point that we're going to deal with on tonight. The tale of two churches. And here in my Bible it says two foundations. Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 29. And the word of God reads, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like the scribes. I've told this story before. Dr. Evans, Dr. Tony Evans, who has uh, written the biblical commentary for Genesis and Revelation, the first African-American theologian and pastor to do that. And so that's such a high honor. And he is a trusted voice who hears from God to speak the word of God. And he always uh, shares a story, even here in the commentary. And I heard it firsthand when I got to hear him preach, I believe over probably 10 or 11 years ago here in Evansville, he shared a story about having a crack in the wall. And even after he had a few guys come out and try to fix the wall, cover it up, at the end of the day, that, rack, that crack excuse me, kept showing up. And at the end of the day, he found out that he had a shifting foundation. And the reality is, according to the text, we either got, to, we either got one or the other foundations working in our lives. Either we have a solid rock foundation, who is Jesus, and which is based off the word of God, we are prayerful people. We are uh, people who don't mind praising and worshiping God because that's what we know we're called to do. We operate uh, using our spiritual gifts. We serve. We, we, we give. Whatever God is leading us to do, we are sons and daughters that are led by the Spirit. We look to be obedient. If we mess up, we look to repent. 
We look to forgive if we've been wronged. We just want to represent the kingdom in the earth. We want to stand on that solid rock foundation. Jesus, we know, is the rock of ages. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the chief cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first stone that is laid when any building or house is built. And so we know Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He is our foundation. Then, if we don't take heed to God's word, we're building on what the Bible says to be a sandy foundation according to verse 26 and we become not wise but foolish those who built their house on sand so that means the the wind can come the rain can come the rivers arise and pound against the house and it's all going to fall apart why because we're not using the messiah's materials if you can remember this i've always shared this from time to time think about a noah's day if Noah would have built the temple, excuse me, if Noah would have built the ark according to his own liking, with his own materials, or if he would have used the materials God told him, but he wanted to use his measurements and not God's measurements. When the flood waters finally came after he finally had it built, it would have fell apart. So at the end of the day, we got to make sure that we are using the Lord's materials we're using the things that he has equipped us with so that we can build properly. Same thing with Solomon. If Solomon builds the temple with his own materials, the way he wants to, the Lord wouldn't have felt welcome or pleased to allow people to come into his presence to worship and to ask for forgiveness and repent in the temple. Why? Because the temple was not built the way he wanted. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor laboreth in vain. We have to ask ourselves the questions. Why, while we're doing all this work for God in the church, are we really doing it for him or are we doing it for ourselves? Are we really laboring for the Lord? Are we really doing it according to his instructions, his guidance, his direction? Or are we doing it for our ego? Are we doing it to be seen? Are we doing it for fortune and popularity? We have to ask ourselves these series of questions when we're doing anything that we say we're doing for God. Because the reality is we could be doing a whole lot of work, but it doesn't mean we're in his will. We could be doing a whole lot of work, but it doesn't mean that we're led by God's wisdom. We could be doing a whole lot of work, but it doesn't mean that God is pleased with what we're doing just because we call it the work of the Lord or church work. At the end of the day, if we're not having a desire to establish the kingdom within the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls, then we're not establishing the Lord's kingdom, we're establishing our kingdom that is really disguised ultimately as Satan's kingdom because anytime we get in the way of what God wants us to do, excuse me, anyway, we, we, get in, we get in front of God and we're trying to do what we want to do instead of what God says do, we automatically put ourselves in the same position that Lucifer was in when he got kicked out of heaven with a third of the angels who became demonic forces all because of pride and ego wanting to worship in the glory for self. When we find ourselves lifting our hands and we're not lifting our hands to God, we're lifting our hands to the God of ourselves. So what type of foundation are we building on? What type of foundation is our marriage built on? What type of foundation are we building, raising our children on? What type of foundation are we building our financial portfolio or those we impact that uh, with the people that we work with? or even in our community. Because there's two different churches here that are unfortunately being represented even in 2021. Those who are really doing the Lord's will and those who claim to be doing it, but they're really not. They're disguising it and masking it, if you will, to use that term in this pandemic. They're putting on the mask of saying we're doing God's will when the reality is, just like the mask that covers up the mouth, what they're really speaking is their will. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, God. I want this cup to pass from me. I don't want to be separated from you. I know I'm going to have to take on the cross. I know I'm, I'm going to have to take on the mockery, the shame, the guilt, being beaten. The most horrible punishment known to man. But yet, nevertheless... Not my will, but your will be done. Because at the end of the day, Jesus knew that in exchange for his life was going to give us life. And the father was going to give him life again on the third day. 
Somebody needs to know that God still desires to take you from a sandy foundation where everything is falling apart, nothing that seems to be working out. Every time you turn around, when you put your hands to it, it crumbles. But God says, when his hand is on you, once you put your hands on it, whatever that it is that he's called you to, it won't fail. It will stand the test of time. I was just sharing that with my mother in love on today. She has a nice fence around the house. And I said, that's the fence that has stood the test of time. And she said, yeah, a couple of tree limbs have even hit the fence. Listen, all of us have been hit with some things in this life, some difficulty, some devastation, some despair, some depression, some difficulty. We've had some obstacles. We've had adversities. We've had issues and problems where our back was against the wall and we felt like we were between a rock and a hard place. We've been in those times where we feel like, God, where are you in this? And I don't understand why I'm going through that. And why did this happen? But at the end of the day, even when we may have asked, God, where are you in this? And why did you allow this to happen? The same God that allowed it is the same God that shows up to the rescue. Without a cape, don't need no x-ray vision. Why? Because he is the God that created everything. And he still desires to show up. Why? Because he's the true hero. He may use us as the vessels, but he's the true hero. I know our Catholic brothers and sisters may highlight Mary, but Mary was just the vessel, but it was what was inside of Mary with who we worship. So we need to understand that God wants to take us from having a sandy foundation where everything falls apart because life will happen. It's not if, it's not when, but it's knowing that it's going to happen. But at the end of the day, God will keep us even when the winds and the waves blow. God will keep us even when things get hard, but we got to trust him. There's too many people out there who are saying, wondering why, why is this happening? Why is this going on? Who do you trust? Who are you looking to? We can't even look to the hills because the reality is when you study that particular text in the Psalms where it says, look up to the hills from which cometh our help, my help cometh from the Lord. The Psalmist is like, do I look to the hills? Do I look high? How high do I look? I got to look beyond the hills because when you study that, you know that there were people who built altars worshiping other gods in the hills. So I can't look to the hills because it's danger in the hills. But I got to look to the one who created the hill, the one who died on the hill one day on Friday that we're going to celebrate even more on Good Friday and understand that he has a plan and a purpose for me. He wants me to stand on a solid rock foundation. Here's the thing. When disaster strikes... We got to make sure, first and foremost, that we don't sweat the small stuff. I always share this with my family. Don't sweat the small stuff because when the big stuff comes, if you trip about the small stuff and that knocks you down, then the big stuff is going to knock you out. So we can't trip about the small stuff. Every small thing that comes to try to irritate us or if it seems like every time we turn around is always something, we need to know that those are just like spiritual pop quizzes. God wants to see. After all the shouting we do, the clapping, the dancing, the singing, the reading, the studying that we do, he wants to see, okay, now are you going to apply what you should have been applying in the first place? Or are you just going to play around and not really pay attention in the classroom of life so that when things happen, you know what to do? I'm a firm believer. The sooner we trust God and we take him at his word and we have faith, and we don't allow the small stuff to trip about, uh, to, to cause us to trip, and we get all upset about it. Think about this. Jesus woke up out of his sleep after the disciples thought they were going to die because water is getting in the boat. Jesus woke up and said, peace be still. Oh, ye of little faith. What, what y'all doing? I've taught y'all this. And that's the same thing God is saying to us. I know that's another storm. I know it's another situation. I know it's another circumstance. Will you not apply my word? Will you not trust me? Because there's something heavier that's coming. And if you are allowing yourself to get so frustrated now, so upset, throwing your hands up, getting impatient, then when the big stuff comes, you definitely won't be able to handle it. The big stuff like having to bury a spouse or a child, the big stuff. When you're having a foreclose on your house, the big stuff, when you're going to your job and you've been doing the best you could for the last 5, 10, 20 years, and they say they got to let you go because we're cutting back. It's a pandemic. We don't have enough money to pay this out and pay that out. The big stuff, when the people 
you trusted as friends turn their back on you and they betray you. The big stuff, when the big stuff happens, when you go to the doctor and they tell you that they found something and now we got to do a procedure, we have to have surgery or you have to go through chemo or you have to go through radiation or you have to start taking these pills. The big stuff. When those things happen, we have to make sure that our faith is built on a solid rock foundation. Solid rock. Because all others are sinking sand. Nothing can be built on sand. It looks nice out on the beachfront. Looks real, real nice. You can see the sunset. You can see the water. But if it doesn't have a strong, strong foundation around all that sand, when the storms of life happen, it's going to collapse. But here's the thing. Even when you see an actual storm, you see cities that have been hit hard by tornadoes or typhoons or tsunamis. Even if houses are blown down, if there's a strong foundation there, you can build back on it. Oh, man, that's good. At the end of the day, there may be some people, places, and things that may get blown out of our lives. God may allow it, but the same God that allow it can also allow greater things to be built on top of it. He can give you greater relationships. He can take you to better and greater places. He can give you greater things. Why? Because your faith is built on a solid rock foundation where we trust and know that he's going to come through for us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We're going to continue to trust. We're going to continue to lean and depend on him, not on our own understanding. Because if we look around, we can have a whole lot of despair about what has happened, especially in this last year. But we can also look at the fact that God has still been keeping us. We're still here, kept by his grace, making it through, all because of his goodness. So we see two different foundations here. And Jesus is literally speaking a word that is so powerful. Still to us today. The people in the text were astonished because they had never heard the Pharisees speak like this. Because of the truth be told, the Pharisees, even though they looked like their lives were built on a solid rock foundation, their lives were just as sandy. God has not called us to be sandy Christians. That when any and everything happens in our lives, just like in the text, when the rivers rise or when the rain falls or when the winds blow, we just fall to it. No, we need to be able to stand the test of time. Like in football, take the tackle and get back up and keep moving the chains. Why? Because we're trying to touch down in his presence. We're trying to score points for the kingdom. We're trying to do the will of God. That's what he's called us to do. That's what we got to be about. That's what we got to do. Over in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it's the letters to the seven churches. Now, there are seven churches here. Some churches are doing God's will, but God has a specific word for each church. Two churches in particular, the church of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. God gives them a word and letting them know that you've been faithful. You've been doing what I've been calling you to do. Even though you don't have much, you're rich in faith. You're strong. You're keeping my word. You are sharing my love everywhere, even in spite of the temptations around you that's trying to pull my people away from God. You're staying faithful. God is calling us to be that type of church that remains faithful. There's so many false teachings out here. There's so many men and women of God, preachers, pastors, prophets, whatever particular place or calling that they believe that the Lord has created them for that are not speaking a word that is from God. They're allowing the culture and the times and what we're going through. People are disguising messages literally with racist tones. People are speaking messages that are tearing down churches but not there to build up. Now, God is all for a rebuking word. God is all for speaking a word that challenges us, that stretches us, that reminds us that as much as, yes, he is gracious, he's also a God of truth, and he's called us to repent from our sin and not be comfortable in it. But we can't just leave a word in tough love on people. We can't just be tough and hard. We also have to bring a word of grace. 
and love and compassion and reminding that the same God that saw you in your sin also can bring you out of it and forgive you for it. And so we got to be that faithful church that helps restore people, meet the needs of others. People that are getting out of prison need to know that God loves them. People that are in a hospital need to know that God is a healer, that the Lord is a deliverer. People that are out on the streets and don't have much, they need to know that God does more than just put food on the table and clothes on their back. But that is a start for those that are without those things. We need to be the miracle that people are praying about. I truly believe that we can be like answer prayer. Like when Peter was in prison and the saints of God were praying, and while they were still praying, Peter was at the door. I truly believe that as we pray, what we pray about will be at the door. We just got to keep trusting them and be that faithful church like the church of Philadelphia. But they had their faith built on a solid rock foundation. But there was another church, the church of Laodicea, that just like in Matthew 7, they built their foundation on sand. And the Bible says, Jesus said, that you are a church that's neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold, but you're not. So I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Why? Because you are lukewarm. You're rich in material, but yet you're poor spiritually. Spiritually impoverished. Poor. You don't have anything at all. There are a whole lot of people today that think just because they got big buildings and big budgets and they got this big cross and they got all the bells and whistles. They got all the latest technology. And I'm not saying that those things don't have their place and it can't enhance the experience in far as in being able to market or advertise and put out information about what's going on at the church. All of those things have their place. The internet, projector streams, being able to go live, social media platforms. Absolutely, we're all for that. But they cannot, should not replace the anointing. They cannot replace the power of God. Because listen, we can have all those things, but if we're preaching the wrong message or even preaching the right, right message with the wrong attitude, if we're walking around arrogant, if we don't care about the least of these, when Jesus said, if you care about the least of these, you care about me, you're loving on me when you love on those who are less fortunate, we got to remember we all have a responsibility as a believer not to be lukewarm. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to dismiss me. I can hear David speaking from Psalms 51. Cast me not away from your presence. And Lord, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me, but create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. Restore the joy of my salvation. That needs to be the prayer on today because there are a lot of buildings that are open with people on the inside, but the people don't have God on the inside. There are a lot of people who have forsaken God. They've walked away from God. They were faithful at one point in time. But when God started shifting and transitioning and started doing new things, they didn't agree. And instead of seeking the Lord to confirm what he said, they sought themselves. They sought the crowd, but they didn't seek the Christ. And no wonder they're in a crisis because certain things in our lives that come are necessary for growth. But there are certain things that God allows that are unnecessary so that he can shake up our lives and hope that we will repent, see him, so we can be brought back to righteousness, holiness, repentance, restoration, a contrite heart, a renewed spirit. They say, God, it's not about me. Even though I don't like what I see, if this is what you want, not my will, God, but yours. Make me the church you want me to be. I put two emojis in the title of the lesson on tonight. The tale of two churches. One is a nice building that looks real nice, got a cross on it, and the other looks like a trap house. Because the reality is, some of us are treating the Lord's house well. We come in and we are desiring for the Holy Spirit to work through us, in us, and around us. We want God to have his way. We want God to release his power. We want God to heal. We want God to, to, to bless and allow people to come out of wheelchairs or allow people to come out of hospital beds, cancer-free, AIDS-free, corona-free. We are believing by faith that the Lord can still do miracles, signs, and wonders. We want God to speak a word even before a word is spoken to anybody else. We want God to speak in the house, and we want apostles and 
and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors to flow under the anointing as the Spirit of God leads them. We want to be the church from the pulpit to the door that knows that it's not only power behind the podium, but there's power in the pew. Why? Because Jesus said, I've given you power. You may sit in a pew. You may be sitting on your couch. You may be sitting at your table, but man and woman of God, young boy, young girl, young teenager, you have power because of resurrected Christ that yes, we're going to celebrate on April the 4th, but each and every day we celebrate the resurrection because he got up with all power. He is risen since I have power. You have power to shout in your house right now. You got power more than your utilities, more than what is put on your paycheck. You got power that can move mountains, power to cast out devils, power to tell diseases to leave and enemies to leave you alone. And even if they don't, God said they can prepare a table before you. Why? And serve you. Why? Because God is with you. He's with us. We got power. I don't have to walk around and be afraid. Because I got power. Police officers don't make me scared. Why? Because I got power. I know the God that created them too. I got power. They can tell you, you no longer have this job anymore. Don't worry about it. I got power. The doctor can tell you this or that. Don't worry about it. I got power. Nothing in this life can defeat us. Even if certain things come, they may cause some of us to go to sleep for a little while. We still got power. How do I know? Because for anybody that believes in Jesus, even if they close their eyes on this side and they're sleeping longer than what we want them to, I believe by faith. Shout unto God and be thankful. That the people that we love, that we know knew God, that we know walked in the word of God, had faith in God, trusted in God, raised their family in God. That uncle, hallelujah, is going to get up. That grandfather, that, that, that father-in-law, that mother-in-law, that spouse, that child, they're going to get up and rise again. Why? Because they had power when they walked on the earth. And power is going to get them back up. Somebody shout in your home on today. Thank God for the power we have in Jesus. Let's be the church that's not lukewarm. Let's be the church that is not playing games because the enemy is not playing. The enemy is not playing PS5 and Xbox. The enemy literally has weapons of supernatural mass destruction. He is looking to try to steal kill and destroy. He ain't playing. But that's why we stay on our knees. That's why we keep talking to our father. Because he has all power. And all power has been given unto Jesus. And we share in that power. We are joint heirs with Christ. So therefore, regardless of what may come our way, we can persevere. We can endure. We may cry tears. It may be difficult and hard, but we can still press on. We can keep on pushing. We can keep holding on. Even if it seems like what we're holding on to is a few strings, I dare you and encourage you to tie a knot in those strings and hold on and watch the hand of God keep you all the way through. Let's be the church that is faithful, that is committed, that is dedicated to God no matter what. And don't allow what happened yesterday to affect our today. I got to say this. We got to stop expecting God's best for people that have already rejected his best. They don't want it. If you remember in the Bible, God had a conversation with Samuel. Samuel was mourning Saul. Saul, who was the king of Israel, he started off good. He looked good. He was tall. Head and shoulders above the other men. He slayed his thousands. He started off with God. But as he got a little power, pride, pride started to seep into his heart. And before you know it, he started to seek fortune tellers and witches for direction. He only wanted God when it was convenient. And God removed his spirit from Saul. 
kept him in position, but he no longer had power. <laughs> there are a whole lot of people that are in position, but they don't have no power. And the only reason they're calling the shots that they're calling is because they're in position. But everything that they're calling out to do doesn't have any power. So you can try to stamp God's name to it. But if he didn't ordain it, if he didn't breathe on it, if he didn't call it, it doesn't have any power. It's not from him. In other words, just like he told the church of Laodicea, you ain't hot or cold. I'm spitting that out of my mouth. Because every time we speak, it's a word that God has already confirmed. At least that's how it should be. Every time we, as the people of God, speak, as witnesses, as ministers of the gospel. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are a minister of the gospel. We're the priesthood of all believers because we all have access. It ain't just the apostles and the prophets and the pastors and the teachers and the evangelists. We're not the only ones who have access to God. All of us have access to God. So we're the priesthood of all believers. So just like uh, Aaron got to go in, we get to go in. Just like Zechariah got to go into the holies of holies, we get to go into the holies of holies. Why? Because we've been given access to through Jesus, who ripped the veil from top to bottom. I haven't lost my point. Saul was tripping. God removed his spirit. Samuel was mourning Saul. God said, how long are you going to keep on mourning over them? Wipe your eyes. Clean yourself up. Get over him. He don't want what I got. But I got somebody. Go on down to Bethlehem. Go to the house of Jesse. There's a young man who my hand has been on. His name is David, a shepherd boy. Go put your hand on him. Anoint him. He's the one. I look at the heart. Y'all looking at suits. Y'all looking at the outer appearance. Y'all looking at the build. Y'all looking at, oh, he got a sword. Oh, he looks like a king. Oh, she looks the part. Listen, God is looking for purity, not position. He'll give position to the pure at heart because the pure at heart got power. Because the pure at heart know that it's not them, it's the God working through them. For anybody that gives me a compliment, I say thank you. But I'm always quick to say it's the God in me. Because the reality is I am wretched and undone. The reality is my righteousness is still and will always will be nothing but a filthy rag without Jesus filtering me, literally detoxing me, literally cleansing me and washing me over and over and over again. It's not me, it's Jesus. Turn to your loved ones at home, type in the comment section, it's not me, it's Jesus. The goodness you see, the good attitude, me serving, me not flipping somebody off uh, while we switching lanes and they mad at me because I got over before them. The reason why I didn't give you the middle finger is Jesus. The reason why I didn't get out the car and whoop your head is Jesus. Why? Because he's the one who's making me better. Last week, last month, or last year, me and you would have had some serious words and I probably would have ended up in the county jail. But because of his power, because of what he brought me from, I cannot allow yesterday to affect my today because I got a future. I got a promise. I got a destiny to reach. I got six people I want to talk about and then we're going to close out. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. We're still talking about the tale of two churches, two foundations. Cain and Abel. Brothers. The first two children of Adam and Eve. Cain worked with his hands on the ground, tilled the soil, produced crops, fruits, vegetables. Abel, young shepherd, worked with the lamb. When it came a time to worship the Lord and to give their best offering, Abel gave his best, Cain didn't. The Bible says Cain was angry because Abel's offering was accepted. His wasn't. But God had told Cain, listen, if you would just give your best, 
Repent in your heart. Don't allow your anger to overtake you. Why? Because sin lies at the door. The same sin that got your parents banished from the Garden of Eden lies at the door. And the same, the same Satan that worked through the serpent to deceive them now wants to deceive you in your heart to cause you to be jealous and envious of your brother's offering instead of admiring the work that he put forth, the purity in his heart, the love and the faith that he had to say, I want to give God my best and I'm not going to hold back. Cain, don't be that way. But what did Cain do? For those of us that know the word of God, he remained angry. Jealousy will cause you to just talk about them in a bad way. Envy will cause you to go from talking to now plotting how you can take them out because every time you see them, it's a reminder of how you fell short. And we all fall short of God's glory. But instead of looking at Abel and saying, saying, you know what? Like my brother gave his best. I can give my best crops. I can give my best fruit, my first fruits. I don't have to give God leftovers. He didn't give me leftovers. Let me give him my best. That's not what Cain did. The Bible says Cain rose up one day, killed his brother. The first time we see murder in Scripture. Cain was a vagabond. He was sent out as a wanderer. Abel's blood was a witness. It screamed out. It got God's attention because life was spilled out of a human body. Life had already been spilled out of an animal's body. The skin from the animal had to cover the parents that were symbolic of the covering of their sin, just like the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world began was slain for us. But this was the first time we see in Scripture that human blood is spilled all because of jealousy and envy. To tell the two churches, because even in today's times, Jesus said, even if we got hate in our heart, we've already murdered our brother or our sister. How many of our brothers and sisters have we murdered in our minds and our hearts? All because we hated to see what they had. Hated to see them with the house or the car or getting more money. Or they got, they, they were blessed to be able to have children before some of us. They got the position in the church that we wanted. But if the truth be told, they had the faith, the work ethic, they had the spirit, they had the right mind, they had the right movement and the right motives. They were about kingdom and they were about being kind. And God blessed them over time for their patience with what he had for them. And instead of asking, brother, sister, how were you able to do that? What did God do in your life to bless you like this? Because I've been trying to do some things and I've been messing up. Now, when we ask those questions, we have to be real and open to, to some possible constructive criticism of where we went wrong. But it's to help us. And if Cain just would have listened to God, he still could have had a brother that would have helped him to show him how to give his best. Some of us are assassinating the character and reputations of a lot of Abels in the church. The Abels who know God is able to do anything but fail. And we're just like Cain, bringing pain to everybody. Murdering everything in sight that we're jealous of, that we're envious of. All because we don't want to give our best. The Cains of the world don't desire to give their best unto God. And then they want to hate on everybody else that does. When the same God that blessed the Abels of the world to give their best offering will also bless you. Cain, maybe you're watching on today. Brother or sister, repent. Don't allow that jealousy and envy to go on any longer, to consume your life, where you are killing relationship after relationship. There are some people who literally, just like Cain in the story, have killed loved ones because they were jealous of what God was doing in their loved ones. 
There are men and women who have killed their marriages. You're stunning the growth of your children. Can't keep a job because you are skillful in what you do. You're talented in what you do. But the people hate to see you come into office. Because even though you're educated and you're skillful, you're a jerk. You're foolish. You're wild. You're unstable. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We can't go to church and say amen, but then go to work and try to hurt a man or a woman. It doesn't work that way. We have to allow God to make us and mold us and to shape us. And if there's anything that is not like him, he's still able to remove the hard heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. We got to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves so that we can be in the same position as we see those who are doing great so we can do great for the God that made and created us. Okay. If you did or didn't like the story of Cain and Abel, okay, let's go to two others. Let's go to Jacob and Esau. The Bible says that when Jacob and Esau was born, Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel. As they grew up, Esau became a man. He was a hunter. He was a man of the outdoors, a man of the field. He loved hunting. Jacob was more one who stayed in the house, did some domestic things, helped out his mother. He was more close to his mother, Rebecca. Esau was close to his father, Isaac. There came a time when Isaac got older. This is Abraham's son, Isaac, the promised seed. His two seeds, Jacob and Esau, they grow up as men. The Bible says Esau came in tired and famished from being out in the field, and he was ready to eat. Jacob is a trickster. He's known for being a con artist. He's known for uh, trying to get over on people. You may know some people like that. And Esau was like, man, I'm so hungry. Jacob's like, hey, I got some food for you, but give me your birthright. The birthright was the position, it was the mantle that was given to the oldest child. That when the father passes away, he will be the head of the family. It was such a, a high honor and blessing to have that birthright. But because of Esau's appetite, he quickly gave up his birthright without even thinking of the implications of how important, of how huge of a mistake that he was making. All for a bowl of soup, a bowl of gumbo. All right? Jacob now has the birthright. Jacob is to be the head of the family. As a trickster, as a con artist. Later on, Jacob, when he saw Esau coming, he was afraid because he knew that he tricked his brother. When it was time for Isaac to pass away, Jacob, because Esau was a hairy man, Jacob got his arms all nice and furry and hairy like his brother and went in. And when Isaac was about to pass away, his vision was bad, so he couldn't see his sons clearly. He had put the birthright on Isaac. Instead of Esau. So when Esau shows up. Ready for the birthright. Isaac was like. Son I've already given it to you. Esau was like. I wasn't even here. Jacob had already been there. Tricking his brother out of his birthright. Doing him wrong. Now. We see in both instances. Two mistakes. Two issues. Two problems. This is not the situation where. One was better than the other, like with Cain and Abel. Both of these brothers got issues. But let's deal with Esau. Esau totally missed how important it was to have that birthright. To lead his family into a legacy of living for God and doing his will. He allowed his appetite to get in the way. And we can be the same way. Allowing our appetite of what we want, our desire. To override what God desires to do in us, through us, and around us. A lot of us will forfeit the blessing that God wants to give us 
to lead and take charge as he leads. All because of the desire that we feel of anxiety, of being fearful. I don't want to. I'm going to do this. I don't want to do that. Don't allow your appetite to keep you from the anointing that God wants you to walk in. Don't allow anxiety and fear. Don't allow what happened in your past to keep you. Don't allow the desire of sin. Because that's what happens to a lot of us. Sexual immorality, lying and gossiping. We allow those things to keep us from walking into the fullness of what God has for us. Now, God can still work in us, through us, and around us in spite of us. But he can do so much more because there comes a time where he's going to be gracious. He's going to be kind. Those doors are going to open. Even if we are acting a fool still, loved by his grace. But there'll come a time, there's going to come a season where it's going to like we're constantly hitting a brick wall. Because God is saying, I'm not going to take you any further until you stop acting a fool and allowing your appetite to control your every move. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And just like Cain was deceived by his desire of being jealous and envious towards Abel, Esau was deceived by his own appetite that caused him to forfeit the birthright. Now let's look at Jacob being a trickster. Being a con artist, getting over on people, lying, scheming. Little later on, what we find out, his mother is the one that even put him up to it. Parents, we need to be careful that we don't build double standards in our homes. Our children all need to be held to the same standard. Husbands and wives, we got to be working together as God leads us to make sure that we're raising kingdom children. And not children who are always at each other and disrespectful. It shouldn't be favoritism being shown. But we got ones who will love on the father more than the mother or vice versa. There needs to be a connection. I'm not saying that the children don't have a special connection with a certain parent. But the standard and the love should all be the same. Amen. Jacob is the trickster. But yet God uses Jacob. Even in spite of what he does. What does he later on do with Jacob? Well, when Jacob finds a woman that he wants to get with by the name of Rachel, he runs into Laban, their father. He works for him, but Laban does the same thing to him that Jacob did to his brother. He ran game on him. Okay, you want to work for my daughter? You got to work for seven years. Seven years was up. Now you got to work for seven more years. <laughs> he played him. The same thing that was done to him, he done to his brother. You reap what you sow. But God is so good that even in spite of the consequences for our sin, he can still make us great if we submit to his will. Now, Esau went off doing his own thing. But Jacob, after he wrestled with God, came out with a limp and he came out blessed. Not because of the birthright, but because of the God that put his hand on him and said, I'm going to use you. It could have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But even in the midst of dysfunction, in and out of the house, taking advantage of a blind father and a mother who was tricking and acting crazy, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God can take you from a dysfunctional family and still make you great because his name is great and his hand is on you. We're still talking about the tale of two churches. What type of church do you want to be? Because you could start off bad. But you can end up great, end up good. You may come from rough surroundings. But I just read a post the other day that just because we all came from rough, a uh, rough upbringing, rough craziness, wild, chaotic, doesn't mean that we can't come out and do great things. Esau, probably, I imagine, because his brother taking his birthright was upset about that and probably wanted to harm his brother just like Cain killed Abel. But God made sure that that didn't happen. He made sure that he settled the score and got things together and got things right. He will make things right when we repent. And we may be known for lying, but then God can make us a people that will stand for his truth. 
So that was Cain and Abel. That was Jacob and Esau. The last two people I'm going to talk about is Peter and Judas. Jesus told Peter that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. That's what happened. Peter going around cussing out people. I don't know nothing about Jesus. Jesus is arrested. He's on his way to Calvary, beaten beyond human recognition. Crown of thorns, getting laughed at, spit upon. Peter denies him. He's crying. He's hurt. Judas is so hurt for betraying Jesus with a kiss for 30 shekels of silver that he takes his life. Both were wrong. But how is it that later on, after Judas takes his life, Peter, hiding, out fishing, went back to what he did before God, Jesus called him into the ministry. How is it that he came back, repented and got right with God? How is it that God used him as a great apostle where he wrote First and Second Peter? How is it that Peter would later on said that he wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't think himself to be worthy enough to be crucified right side up like his Savior. How did he get to that? He was just as wrong. We always talk about how sin is not categorized, right? How is it that Peter was able to get back right? Why didn't, why didn't Judas repent? Because there are certain people who get persuaded by Satan. The Bible says David, a righteous man, a man after God's own heart, was persuaded by Satan to start counting the men in his army to see if he had enough strength to go against the ungodly nations that he was going to go to battle with. And God convicted his heart. And he said once again, Lord, I am wrong. This is after he had committed the adoption with Bathsheba. Why are you bringing this up, Pastor Razor? Because even the people of God can be persuaded the wrong way. The, the enemy, all he needs is to present that temptation. That's why those of us, in particular, that are in position, we got to stay on our knees. We got to stay on our face before God. We got to stay in the Word and say, God, it's not me, it's you. What do you want me to do? Things may look to be outnumbered in your life, but you need to know that the Lord is the one that's giving you the strength. The Lord was the one that was giving David all the victories over Goliath, the other giants, and all the other tens and hundreds of thousands of men that came against him and the Israel army. Why? Because it was the Lord that was with him. It wasn't the number of people. It was the people that trusted in the God who has no limits. Peter was persuaded by his own flesh because of what the people were saying and he was embarrassed and he didn't want to be killed and he didn't want to be arrested so he lied and denied the Christ that he said he never would deny. The same Peter that said when it was asked by Jesus who do you say who I am? I know what the people are saying. They say Jeremiah and Elias but who am I? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father. So Jesus was already acknowledging that Peter, you know me. You know my father. Peter, you're saved. I know your heart. But there's going to come a time that your heart is going to fail you. Woo. If we can be real, there have been some times like Peter, we've denied him, we've denied Christ even in the sanctuary, because we didn't have the faith to trust God in that particular season with what we were dealing with and what we were going through. But just like Peter, we went back to some old things, to some old ways. But when Jesus got up from the grave, he told the woman what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. That's exactly what God will do. He will call you out by name to remind you, I'm not just going to generalize uh, your situation. I'm going to make it personal and I'm going to call you out to let you know I have forgiven you and I still got great things in store for you.
because I want you to do it. Not him, not her, but you. I call you. And it's not a mistake. It's not an issue. It's not a problem that you're going to face or go through or commit that will keep you from your assignment. Only you and I can keep ourselves from doing what God called us to do. Unless the Lord wants to take us home right now, nobody can affect what we're going to do for God but us. So even the people of God can be persuaded. But then there are those who have a form of godliness, but they don't discern the power, and they can be possessed by Satan. Satan can persuade the people of God. He can't possess the people of God because we're already possessed by the Holy Spirit. But we, we can be persuaded because we're still in this body. We're still in this flesh. So we still have fleshly desires as we desire to do the will of God led by the Spirit. But Judas, as Jesus is sitting at the table, after washing their feet, after or during rather, the time of the Last Supper, he says the one who dips the bread, that's the one that's going to betray me. They all looking around. He already knew what Judas was going to do. He knew Judas was on assignment from Satan from day one. Judas had saw the miracles just like Peter. He saw the four or five thousand eat. He saw the dead raised. He saw blinded eyes open. He saw deaf ears open up, mute mouths speak, crippled legs start dancing. He saw all of that. But yet the power on display and the power that was walking didn't transform him. It transformed Peter. It didn't keep him from making mistakes, but he still believed in the Christ. But because Judas was already possessed by Satan, once he felt the remorse and the regret of his decision, he couldn't run to repent because he never had it in his heart to operate that way. Satan has a way that once he has us in his hands, he's ready to dismantle us. See, he'll bring us in with the good stuff. Satan will come around like he's your best buddy, like he's your best friend, like he's your ace boom coon. But when things get bad, that's when he shows you who he really is and it gets dark and he's ready to take you out. And the stuff that look good don't look good anymore, but it's too late. I wonder how many people that were faking the funk and playing in ministry have died immediately or are dying gradually, dying slow, all because... They may be saying God from their mouths, Lord from their mouths, but they're not living for the God that they speak about. And they're on their way to a lonely and dark grave. But they're going to die the second death where Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I knew you not, you work of iniquity. Because you talked about me, but you never talked to me. You had all that unconfessed sin in your life and you never repented. You made it seem like just because people were shouting from the words of your mouth that you thought I was pleased to. Because could it be, as people are shouting and praising and commenting online and in person, the people that are singing our praises, God himself is silent. I'd rather have God Rejoicing in song for how we live and the people be silent than the people singing our praises and God be silent because he's not pleased with our lives. We got to make sure that our lives are built on that solid rock foundation and his name is Jesus. I want to be, we want to be, that will be done, the church that God is pleased with and proud of. I pray you were blessed by the word of God on today. The Lord gave me this word uh, a couple of days ago. I had another word already prepared. And that's what I love about God. And that's why when God speaks, you're ready to go in one direction. But as you mature, you got to be willing to make adjustments on the go. Because I had one word already prepared. And the Lord was like, no, go in this direction. And I was like, cool. That takes maturity. Because you can find yourself wanting to negotiate and go back and forth. But God, why is it? God knows best. He ain't got to tell me why. 
I just got to submit to the orders. And maybe our lives will be a whole lot more blessed and fruitful and fulfilling if we'll just submit to the orders. Do what he says. I can't get caught up into the affairs of this life. I can't get caught up in my own feelings, in my own self, reading my own press. Why? Because I'm trying to please the one who chose me. Do we realize he didn't have to choose us? The only reason why we love him because he loved us first. The only reason why we choose him because he chose us first. While we were yes sinners, Christ died. Let's choose Jesus so we can be the church of Jesus Christ. Or as I heard it, be the bride of Christ and not the bride of Chucky. <laughs> Let's be holy and not a horror, all right? Let's be godly, okay? Let's be righteous. Let's represent the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of Satan. Let's not be gross. Let's not be crazy. Let's be Christ-like. Let's rep Jesus. I pray you were encouraged on this evening. I know I have been. I am looking forward to this Good Friday. We're going to talk about the seven last words of Jesus as he was at Calvary, getting ready to go to the grave and get up on Resurrection Sunday morning. We're going to be touching down in Michigan City at 10 a.m. going live. I cannot wait for Resurrection Sunday. I pray that you all are encouraged in the word. Continue to take God at his word. Continue to trust him and watch him see you through. If you desire to be a blessing to this ministry monetarily, you can go to Cash App, dollar sign, that will be done CC at Venmo, TWBDCC as well. God bless you. I appreciate you. Let us pray. God, we honor you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. God, Help us, strengthen us to be that church that we're building that solid rock foundation. We don't want to be lukewarm anymore and forgive us for the times that we have, or even if we're lukewarm right now. God, give us the strength to be the church that continues to be rich in faith, that we give to those in need, that we share our faith, that we love you and we love others, that we'll obey you, Father, and do your will. Help us to learn and be like able to give our best offering. And God, if we're falling short, help us to humble ourselves and get around those that are giving their best so we can see how to give our best as well, Father. God, we don't want to trick and play around, Father. We don't want to forfeit the best that you have for us. So, Lord, I pray daily, God, we be thankful what you for the little that you give. So, God, when you take us a little higher, we can be even more grateful and be mindful to say thank you. And God, when our mistakes get the best of us, Father, I pray that we will continue to run to our safe haven. We will run to your lighthouse to receive your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. That we don't allow the enemy to chase us from your presence. We don't allow him to knock the fight of us, out of us. But we'll keep fighting and keep moving forward to trust that you're able to cleanse us and wash us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sin. So that there is nothing blocking our relationship, but that we're always in right relationship and fellowship with one another. God, we love you. We bless you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and continue to walk in God's will for your life. See you Friday.